I'm excited about the subjects we get to cover. I'm excited to have each of you here and hope that uh, you will enjoy this as much as, as uh, you should. <laughs> For those of you I don't know, my name is Mark Lanier and on behalf of my wife who is uh, uh, at a ladies retreat, <laughs> so she's not here. On behalf of my wife, myself, I wanna thank you for being here. Let me start. And I'm going to start with our most esteemed that everyone is here to hear to some degree or another, uh, Dr. Fred Sanders. Fred, please come up. Uh, Professor Dr. Fred Sanders from Biola University, which I think used to stand for Bible Institute of Los Angeles, that is if true. I'm not mistaken. Uh, he is probably, no, he is the leading, leading scholar on the Trinity who has published comic books. That is true. <laughs> that is true. On the Trinity. <laughs> and if you doubt that, go to your friendly neighborhood theological library and you can find them on the shelves. It took some work getting those, by the way. They're, they're not readily available that easily. But uh, anyway, you'll hear more about him. You already know about him or you wouldn't be here. And you'll hear more about it. Y'all come on in and grab a seat. If you have trouble sitting there, there are seats on the sides. This is a good time just to come in and grab a, a good seat. Is that me that's going like Rice Krispies? Snap, crackle, pop? Um, okay, next uh, we'll call up Jerry Walls. Jerry, would you please come up? Jerry is a professor of philosophy at HBU. Yep, we'll put you right there. He has authored The Poetics of Evil, The Absolute Basics of the Christian Faith. He has a PhD in philosophy from Notre Dame. You're describing Phil. Jerry, you don't have any of that stuff? I have the PhD from Notre Dame, but those are Phil's books. What, what on earth are you doing here? <laughs> I have other books. Okay, I believe that it's very possible that my pages have been wrongly stapled. <laughs> wrongly stapled. Do you teach philosophy of religion? I teach philosophy, at, uh, yes, at HBU, and I do, do a PhD. Do you have a Notre PhD Dame. from Notre Dame? Yes, I do. And my son, who's PhD in philosophy, or D. Phil, from Oxford, says Notre Dame is the best, Notre Dame and NYU, the best philosophy schools That's, in the United States of America. I would agree with that if you're interested in Christian philosophy, for sure. Okay. You have an STM from Yale Divinity School? Yeah. And an MDiv from Princeton? Yep. Have you ever been so wrongly introduced only to be so <laughs> rightly introduced later? I don't think so. I think okay. it's a first. Thank you for being here. We are deeply appreciative. And let's see. Oh, I think it only appropriate I call up Randy Hatchett next because I just did a hatchet job on this introduction. <laughs> Randy, please come on up. Randy is a professor of theology at HBU. Is that right so far? I'm good. Come on. Just nudge me when I get it messed up. <laughs> Trusting God in a Twisted World? Did you write that? Okay. Uh, no, okay. I, I have a manuscript in process. Maybe okay. That's, maybe that's something like that. That may be a manuscript in process. Um, I'll, let me tell you what I know about him. I can tell you for one thing, he has filled, he's not only up here as an educator, he's also up here as a pastor. He has filled the churches, 20 different churches, as an interim pastor where he has pastored that church while they await figuring out who's coming next. In one circumstance, at least, Scott Ryling was next, and you were the interim <laughs> pastor for that. So we've got you up here to be a pastor uh, and give us the pastoral word as well as the academic word, right, if you don't you. mind. We got a, I got a great email from a dear friend, Wallace Henry, Henley, who said, Mark, 
you got to have a pastor on the panel, especially on something as important to the church as the Holy Spirit. And Wallace is right, and that's you. Okay. Okay? <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, Philip Tallon. Come on up here. Assistant Professor of Theology, the Chair of Apologetics out at HBU, and a PhD in Theology from St. Andrews. Yep. And, and the actual author of The Poetics of Evil and the Absolute Basics of the Christian <laughs> <laughs> On sale now on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, that is fantastic. And an MA in Humor from, oh no, that's in Theology, from Asbury Theological Seminary. And you started out at the University of South Florida. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, go Bulls. Well, at some point, my brother-in-law of sorts will be here, but he's not here. John Thee, yeah, from South, well, it's North Florida, but it's all Florida. <laughs> okay, so here's the subject. And, dot, 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 and the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, how we treat the third person of the Trinity as an afterthought in theology and the Christian life. Are you all ready? We will start with a poll of the panel. How many gods are there? One. One? We have one? We've got one? One? How about that? Four people think there is one God. (laughs) Then would you please tell me who is the Holy Spirit? And we will start with Philip since we ended with uh, your introduction. Philip, who is the Holy Spirit? One of the main ways we understand the Holy Spirit and his distinctive work in uh, the triune life is as the power of God. And so um, all kind of metaphors and single words are a little bit reductive, but we can sort of think about, you know, any action God does is a Trinitarian action, um, the Father being the source, the Son being the way, and the Spirit being the power of God to carry it out. And so simplified to a very sort of um, simple degree, that's how we can speak about the Spirit. Okay, we're going to come back to that, but before I take you to task and go all lawyer on you, I want to hear what everyone else has to say to that same question. So, Randy, who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God, divine, and we typically speak of him as person. Okay. Fred? Uh, I agree. The Holy Spirit is God. The, the Lord, you know, and all the, all the resonance that that biblical name has, the Lord and giver of life, who in the eternal life of God proceeds from the Father um, and in the history of salvation is sent or poured out uh, to apply salvation to us on the basis of the finished work of Christ. Okay, Jerry, anything to add? I would just add the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. God, uh, meaning he is God, not an, as an identity statement, but as a predicate statement. In the same sense, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But you don't re- reverse those and say, God is the Holy Spirit. You don't say that. All right. Tomorrow night, uh, Professor Sanders is going to lecture on how the Old Testament and the New Testament speaks of the Trinity. So I don't want to preview that in this, but I want to press on some things. So let me press on some things. We've got several of you who are patristic scholars, who've spent time with the church fathers, the early church, which is appropriate if we're going to be talking about these issues. So within the framework of that, when we say God in three persons, we're using a very ancient concept, but will one of you all please explain to us what a person is in that wonderful creedal affirmation? Who wants to go with that one? (laughs) Well, a person is what there's three of in God. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Um, Person is the answer 
to the question that's raised when you look at Matthew 28, 19, or 20, and Jesus says, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And if you're good at counting, you count to three there and say the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So there's three. And then if someone asks you three what, in the one divine name, in the, in, in the one God, um, you can kind of hem and haw and say, not people like you and me or anything, but person is the answer. There are three persons, uh, irreducible to each other, so that the Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Father, but they are distinct but never separate uh, in the unity of the Trinity. Anybody else want to opine on this? I mean, it's a unique word to use, and the early church chose to use it. Three persons. I think they were using a Latin word at the time. I think even the early church, though, acknowledged that it's a word that functions in a certain way and is stipulated in a certain way, and that um, even those that are kind of pictured sometimes as picturing the Father, Son, and Spirit as a committee of three, um, the Cappadocian Fathers, uh, a remarkable set of theologians uh, from Turkey, when you, I think when you parse them and when you look at them carefully, they're very careful not to give the impression that these are three distinct identities or in effect three gods. So even, even in the ancient setting, the word person has an asterisk by it. It's not just like any human person. And they are really, I think, quite vigilant to, to make that point. So sometimes uh, uh, from a lawyer's perspective, I like to identify things by what they are. But sometimes I can best identify things by what they're not. A differential diagnosis in medical terms. So I've asked you what is or who is the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to ask you what or who the Holy Spirit is not. And in reference to that, I'm thinking about how do people misunderstand the identity of the Holy Spirit. Jerry, you were last, so we're going to move you first and we'll put Philip at the end. How do people misunderstand? What are some common errors we make when it comes to identifying the Holy Spirit? Yeah, um, I, I think there is a tendency to depersonalize the Holy Spirit. So Philip talked about, you know, the Holy Spirit is the power of God or some such thing as that. And there's a tendency, uh, I think, to think of the Holy Spirit as some kind of a, of a force and... Uh, uh, some of the imagery used uh, with respect to spirit, it's like a breath, it's like a wind, it's almost like some kind of a, uh, of a, of a, of a force uh, of sorts, fire, things like that. So when you, when you think in, uh, of the Holy Spirit in those terms, you may easily impersonalize him, depersonalize him, and just see him as maybe some kind of a expression of power generated by the Father that does not have his own personal identity. Okay, so within the framework of that, we've, we've got the, the Greek word for spirit, or the Hebrew word, if we want to go Old Testament, um, is a word that references the idea of breath, wind, and wind, and things of that nature, except this is not ordinary wind or ordinary breath, it's that which is holy, or that which is from God, or of God. Uh, does... does does scripture, is scripture fair to this idea? If, if your answer to my question is we tend to depersonalize the Holy Spirit, where does scripture personalize the Holy Spirit? Well, the book of Acts uh, is one great example when it talks about the, the fact that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and to God, speaking of Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, John 16, I think it is John 16, when it talks about the fact uh, that you shall witness to these things and he, the Holy Spirit, shall witness to these things. So we're the second witness. He's the primary witness, as, as it were. Uh, we speak the word, but he is the really convincing witness that carries the case, which is really important for us to remember when we do uh, apologetics, preaching, evangelism. This is a person speaking, convicting. He will convict the world of sin, righteousness, judgment to come. These are activities of a personal agent interacting with human beings, 
And again, displaying very vividly the personal nature of who he is. I met Ron Larry right here, and he handed me a missive that he, he wanted to speak, and I said, I'm sorry, we don't, this, this is too tightly regulated and timed, <laughs> but he anticipated that, so he gave me this. I think, I think he would amen what you just said and want us to all emphasize the role of the Holy Spirit in evangelism and how important it is right now. So thank you for that, and thank you for the note that you gave me. I apologize that I can't uh, open this up beyond this. Um, okay, let's move on. Fred, what is a common error we make about the Holy Spirit? You know, I'm going to continue the answer that the, the danger, the tendency is to um, speak impersonally of the Spirit, think impersonally of the Spirit. Um, and here, here's what I think is going on when we do that. Um, the Spirit is a person, one of the three persons of the Trinity, who is frequently spoken of in the Bible. So I'm not talking about how folks talk out there. I'm talking about in the Bible, the Spirit is a, um, a wind, power, um, uh, there, there are a number of impersonal, the Spirit is poured out. You know, we, the, the Son of God also came to earth, but we don't say the Son of God was poured out. We would all notice that was kind of weird sounding language. The reason it sounds weird to us is not just because of our traditional Christian culture or something, it's because of the Bible. The Bible gives us this language that the Spirit is someone who is poured out. What that means is, you have to say that the Spirit is a person who is frequently spoken of and manifested impersonally in Scripture. Once you put it that way, you realize, oh, that would be hard to reveal. You know, I'm glad God is a competent revealer because um, if, if there are three persons in God and one of the persons is frequently manifested uh, in a sort of impersonal way with impersonal language, the images are, are fire and wind and things like that, um, that would be really hard to reveal. And it kind of makes sense that people would frequently misunderstand it and say, so there's a personal, there's one person in God and another person in God, and then there's this force. But then you have the ugliness of Matthew 28, 20 being one person, another person, and a force. Uh, that would be a weird thing to lump together and say, baptize in the name of those two and this thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> those two and this thing. I like that. Um, one of the, the books that I've read on the Trinity that I found extremely marvelous at communicating these things started out in the introduction and the fella says he went home to his mom recently this is a fellow who teaches a class on the trinity um, at, at a major university in england he said he went home to his his home uh, his parents home and his mom still had on the refrigerator a drawing that he had done for his mom when he was four years old for Mother's Day. She brings it out on Mother's Day and puts it on the fridge. And he said, if you look at the drawing, you see my mom and the main feature in her, other than the fact she's really big, is that she has a smile and there's a butterfly next to her and a flower. And she's holding my hand and I'm really small. He said, now, as a 30-year-old man, 35-year-old man, he said, I can tell you that that picture is horrible art. But to my mom, it's very precious because it shows what my image of her was as a four-year-old before I was old enough to understand fully what love was, what joy was, our relationship, and yet I tried to portray those things as best as I could. He said, when we try to understand the depths of the Trinity, and this was his point, when we try to understand the depths of the Trinity, we're trying to describe a being that is not human, that is far beyond us, and he's far beyond everything in his creation, so that we don't really have, I mean, how are we going to grasp this being? And he's revealed it to us in terms that are about as accurate maybe uh, in, in an ultimate sense as that four-year-old drawing. Though it's true, it's all valid, it's just a very rudimentary understanding because it's all we got at our disposal right now. Would you agree or disagree? Disagree. 
Yeah, I would agree. I would, I would want to emphasize that um, if you reflect a lot on our weakness as communicators, and then you try to talk about the limitations of theology, you do have to transition over to the last point you made, which is, this is revealed theology. This is God's inerrant, imperfect word. He picked the images. And so it's not the same as me grasping in the dark. Gee, I wonder what God is like. It's God saying, you know what I'm like? Father, Son, Spirit, these are human words and human concepts, and I've chosen them for you. Uh, you know Coco the gorilla who learned a lot of sign language? I believe Coco passed away recently. Um, Coco went through a pretty bad earthquake one time, and her trainers came to her and said, Coco, are you okay? And Coco signaled she was okay. And they said, what was that like? So they were asking a gorilla <laughs> to describe an earthquake in sign language, right? And, and Coco signed, darn floor, big bite. <laughs> which is a pretty great description of an earthquake from a gorilla in sign language. <laughs> but, but I sometimes feel like in theology, that's, that's kind of like what I'm saying. Like, watch me make a sentence about God now in my human language. That's, right? a, that's a marvelous example. <laughs> that's great. Okay, Randy, misconception of the Holy Spirit. That, that, that you can either bounce off what mm-hmm. they've said or give us another one. Well, I'll, I'll maybe uh, extend it. I, I think... Maybe especially in our age, um, a modern folk, um, just depending on who you want to hear tell you how modern folk think, I, I would think uh, Charles Taylor does some uh, profound sort of um, thinking on this uh, front. But I think modern folk have real difficulty processing or grasping, even receiving a witness that somehow a spirit could sort of influence you, right? So. We're not porous, as Taylor mentions uh, folks were before. We are instead buffered, and we, we wouldn't not walk by a wood on a windy night because we were fearful that some uh, spirit would be dislodged, and we'd be, we might be more vulnerable to have the spirit, you know, kind of influence us or touch us or harm us. Instead, we sort of think that we're physical creatures and... That's the way things work, and we don't think in terms of spirit things, <laughs> right? Inter- interacting, we don't really have the imagination and the, uh, and the I- imagery for that, perhaps. So I, th- I think the danger is, is that we uh, translate the spirit in, in rather exclusive terms. Uh, we see the spirit as a cosmic sort of reality. Uh, I wanna say the spirit is present in the world uh, but that's not the only thing I would want to say. Or we might translate it to, to the spirit working in an institution. I think, um, like you mentioned, I've been in 20 churches, and um, it's not robbed from me the uh, faith that the spirit can work in an institution. I, I do believe that still after 20 churches. Um, but all that to say, uh, you, you don't want to limit the spirit to just the, these sort of things. So I, I think we as modern people tend to sort of put the spirit in categories that we can identify more readily. And uh, the personal images and these uh, more dramatic images of power are a little harder for us, so. Okay. All right, that's great. It's really remarkable to just interject. I mean, yeah. when you think about the three words, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Father is clearly a personal word. The Son is clearly a personal word. Spirit is not in the same way. And that's right. part of the problem. I mean, at least in terms of our misconstruing things. Yeah. Which well, brings us back to the baptism and uh, are you baptized into these two people in this thing? Uh, it sort of makes you think it would be a person. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, to, you know, Randy talks about Charles Taylor. I'll just talk about Star Wars. Um, <laughs> because, like, we, can, I think we can blame Star Wars a bit. There was a, a recent uh, poll done by Ligonier Ministries, a thousand respondents, I don't know how statistically on par the um, survey was, but of the respondents, um, over half indicated that the Holy Spirit was a force, but not a person, right? So mm-hmm. the, the force language. And so I do think that there's a kind of a tendency in some ways to view God and as part of that to view the Spirit as kind of an impersonal force working in the universe for our benefit, kind of like the force of gravity or something like that, which is that if we have faith, you know, then things will maybe go well. And so this may be behind when people say that they're spiritual but not religious, kind of what they're, you know, thinking of is that there's this kind of force that, em, you know, emanates throughout the universe that if we kind of connect to it, then things will go well. So I do think there is that, that danger. Um, 
But the thing that originally came to mind when you said what is not, uh, what the Holy Spirit is not, is you know there are many images of the Trinity, and so you see you know the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, and then there are also some little things that say the Father is not the Son, the Spirit is not the um, Son, as a way of distinguishing um, the persons while affirming the unity of the essence, and. Um, and so one, one misunderstanding that's, that's common, I've had students that are dealing with this and known people um, that are dealing with it, is a kind of, there's still a contemporary version of an ancient heresy called modalism, um, which views basically God as being a singular person that like wears different masks, as it were. So wore the mask of the Father and then came to earth in the form of the Son and then now is present with us in the form of the Spirit. And you still find that out there, and so that's one of the reasons why you know, Christians need to be educated in churches and basic doctrines that when they, you know, encounter this, they can say, oh, well, that, you know, that might sound a little bit like what Christians believe, but that's actually not what Christians believe. So, um, as Christians, we, we need to be able to, we want to say that the Spirit is God, but also that the Spirit is not the Father and the Son. In the, in the interest <clears throat> of those who may not be as read in church history, modalism that you're describing Tell us when that heresy was really addressed by the church. Oh, that's, oh man, now I feel like I'm in my viva or something like that. Um, <laughs> um, well, it's, it's come up at various, at various points in various ways. I mean, it's dealt with in, within the, um, you know, the first five centuries of the, of the church, and, and different people have held it at, um, at different points. And so, um, but the, the ancient heresy that we see, you know, often called modalism, um, we see today in denominations like uh, oneness Pentecostalism and, and so forth. So you see you have this kind of same idea as a way of kind of grappling with the, the oneness of God, which is um, clearly affirmed in the Old Testament, God is one, and trying to make sense of the sort of the threeness, how are there three, and modalism or oneness Pentecostalism answers that question by affirming one person in these three different modes. Hence the term modalism. So, so in terms of... of misconceptions of the Holy Spirit, depersonalized, which is in part part of modalism. At the other extreme, uh, perhaps there is a, a, a view that there are three gods and there's no commonality in a sense. Um, uh, I think uh, we would be surprised if a polling were done and the questions were worded properly, how many people believe in essence in three gods uh, as opposed to one? And if pressed to try to understand why one, that's when the lapse into modalism for many might come, I suspect. Um, okay, just found that interesting, sorry. I'll get back to y'all now. So. Let me throw out some different ideas and some different heresies of the Holy Spirit that I've come across in my life and let you comment on them. One, the, the Holy Spirit is God's power to do certain things, but the Holy Spirit does not indwell individuals. Comments? Wrong. <laughs> I kind of gave that away when I said this is one of the heresies I've come across. Um, yes, wrong. I mean, wrong primarily for biblical theological reasons that, that the New Testament talks about the Spirit dwelling in us. Um, Jesus says the Spirit is with you and will be in you. Um, it's, it's central to Paul. I, I don't even know which passage to quote from Paul. There's so much, like, Footnote, Romans 8, you know, all of it. Um, th that's the main reason. Um, the other reason is there's an intimacy with God that I think people experience and register when they're born again, which is best explained and best described as connecting with that biblical theology that the Spirit now dwells in them on the basis of the redemption in Christ. I say it that way because um, I've been in a lot of different kinds of churches. I grew up Pentecostal and um, I've been in a lot of charismatic settings, and every now and then someone will claim to feel the spirit in them differently than the sun. Like, right there the sun was with us, but ooh, now the spirit showed up. 
And I sort of stand back in awe of such people and think, really, do you have, like, that is amazingly sensitive. Can you actually? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I once drove a car where the, the speedometer didn't work, and, you know, you were kind of more or less guessing and getting it generally right. And I thought, maybe I'm missing a spiritometer that some people have where they can detect when he's here. I'm more inclined to think, no, I think, I think what's happening there is they're misunderstanding themselves. They know the spirits in them because of the Bible. And then when they feel God's presence, period, they rightly describe that as the spirit, but ascribe that to some kind of like, I can tell, like the needle pegged there, so that was the spirit. Yeah. Well, I, go ahead. I was just going to say, picking up with respect to Romans 8, I think part of the problem too is that too many people think Romans 7 describes the typical Christian experience. I mean, I'm amazed at how many people think that's, and in fact, I remember a conversation. Jerry, with, interrupt for a moment and make sure everybody's on the same page. Romans 7 versus Romans 8. What's the difference between Romans the two? Romans 7 is all this talk about, you know, the flesh against the spirit, and I, I do not what I long to do, and what I know I should do, I don't do, and this, this sense of a struggle in which you fail much of the time, if not most of the time. Whereas Romans 8 is about the Holy Spirit empowering us to live according to the way God desires us to live, witnessing to us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I vividly remember a conversation, uh, actually at HBU, with some of our graduate students. Um, they had gone to a Christian school, I will not name it. And um, I was talking to them about Romans 7 and 8, and I was saying, no, Romans 7 is not the typical Christian experience. The typical Christian experience is Romans 8. And what was astonishing is they'd never even heard that understanding of Romans. So if you think of Romans 7 as the normal Christian life, the idea of the Holy Spirit dwelling, witnessing, empowering, etc. seems hard, hard, hard to believe. Although, if I were going to take issue with you on that, you know, I might suggest... If I were to read Romans 7 and say that I think Romans 7 is actually the typical Christian life, my argument to you would be that when Jesus said the Holy Spirit will come, says he will convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment. And so the Romans 7 person to me seems to be a person who's pretty convicted of sin mm -hmm but just needs that extra little push from the Romans 8 of wretched man that I am who will save me from this. Well, the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from right. a vicious cycle of sin and death. So, and, and, and I'm not trying to force that reading on anybody, but wouldn't you agree that a conviction of what sin is is a very direct work of the Holy Spirit in an individual. Yes, and, and, but, but I think the conviction of sin is something that happens to people before they're even converted, before the Holy Spirit dwells within them. It's when we uh, receive the, the Holy Spirit, when we're regenerated, that we accept that conviction. And then after we are regenerated, of course, God does continue to convict us of remaining sin in our life and continue to transform, cleanse, heal, sanctify. But the idea that it's this continual battle, that that's the norm of what a Christian life is, I think is very much at odds uh, with any meaningful idea of dwelling. And even if you think about power, I mean, if, if this is the power of the Holy Spirit, the best it can do is, you know, lead us in a life of constant conflict and constant struggle and constant failure. Even the power gets diminished on that score, let alone dwelling. Hmm. I think the strongest piece of evidence for that is when you're reading along in Romans, the Holy Spirit comes in pretty clearly around chapter 5, is, doing, is mentioned quite a bit in chapter 6, and then just goes away for 30-something verses while the, the speaker in Romans 7 is like, oh, I want to do this, but I don't do that. Um, I agree with your point that the Spirit can bring conviction that leads to that kind of wrestling, but he's, he's not mentioned in Romans 7. Then he comes back in in Romans 8. And by the way, Romans 8 is not some kind of happy, clappy, shiny, everything's great now Christian life. Right. It's glorious, but it includes a lot of groaning and mm -hmm. a lot of persecution. Right. Um, right. And, and, and in fairness, just wanting to always provide some little <laughs> perspective, Romans, the spirits in Romans 8 won, mm -hmm. and Paul didn't sit there and say, next chapter, next chapter. 
So, I mean, he's, I'm not sure that just to say the Spirit disappears for 30 verses, mm -hmm. or we might want to just... <laughs> A long know. stretch of writing, how about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For Paul, what, three sentences? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a three-sentence thought project then yeah, about what if you right. weren't to mention the Holy Spirit in the Christian life? You'd get a pretty grim description. Okay, so within the framework, unless you all want to add at this end of the table to that... No, your, your previous question about presence. Yes. I would just say I, I think that is at the heart of the mystery. Um, and uh, adding to the idea that uh, that is a persistent picture in the Bible, I, I do think the church is very consistent pressing those images and trying to flesh them out. The images uh, change a good bit within uh, also uh, like participation language and sharing um, but it's persistent. Uh, you, you have it in Calvin. He suggests uh, there is this uh, necessity to have an, uh, to enter in to to this spirit. And if you're not in this spirit, you're not really a Christian. All right, sitting over here, unseen by most of y'all, is David Capes. David's a dean in, in uh, biblical studies at Wheaton. Used to serve with several of these folks on staff at HBU, teaching in the Bible department is written on Paul, New Testament translation, Romans 7, before we leave it. Do you have anything to add? <laughs> no. Oh, thanks. Okay. Yeah, come on up so okay. people can see you, David. <laughs> yeah. We've got so many scholars in here, it's hard to figure out who goes on the panel and who doesn't. So yeah. all scholars beware, I may be calling on you. I, I do think that, I mean, you, you do have this moment in Paul where one is baptized into Christ, right? And Paul takes on this new, describes this new life. And then, and then Romans 7 does seem to provide some interruption at that point. And so what do we do with that? Is that the typical Christian life or is that an abnormal moment? Or is that in the sort of the pre-Christian existence? And I, I, really, I really kind of regard it as a pre-Christian existence, I think. And that Romans 8 says this is the resolution. Therefore, there's now no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. All that condemnation is before. That's how I read Paul in Romans 7. It's before Christ. It's B.C. You want to say it that way. And then after Christ, uh, we really do have this new life. It's not perfect. I mean, there's struggles, there's groaning, there's persecution, like you said. And, and the very ending of, of the chapter it says, you know, there's nothing ultimately that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So that's the resolution. That's where life is headed. But the reality is that there is this sort of pre-Christian existence that we struggle with. I think it's, it, it, there's the Spirit. The Spirit is working in us before we're saved, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just this, now that I'm saved, now that I'm converted, baptized, now I have the Spirit. No, the Spirit has been working, nudging, um, coercing, uh, drawing us to Him. So that's how I see it. All right, now let's find someone else on this subject while we're doing this. Peter Davids. Peter. Romans 7. Pre-Christian? Christian? Aberrant Christian? Normal Christian? Well, what about Jewish? Mm -hmm. um, and he right reads it as uh, Jewish... Um, experience um, with the, um, uh, the the struggle between the, well what I'd put it in terms of the eights or the, the impulse in the person which you have already found in Romans 5 um, in, the, in the suffering and the um, a, a, as a collective that is there's, there's no solution in in his Jewish in the Jewish Gentile experience in the Jewish experience until you get to the spirit okay and those of you who want more on this we'll have N.T. Wright here next month and we'll ask <laughs> Tom what he's got to say about it as well um, 
We're going to get feedback if I don't turn that off. Okay, so how do we know if we have the Holy Spirit? I know there's a sentence in 1 John that directly answers that question, but I can't, <laughs> I can't remember it. <laughs> By this we know that we have the Spirit. Uh, nope. If we love Sorry. one another. How about if we have love for one another? Is it because if we love one another? Yeah. yeah, if we, yeah. And if we confess Christ, I mean. Yeah. So, but now, now here, here's the reason I'm asking. So I, I uh, did my scholastic training in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, I was around a lot of folks who believed in a baptism of the Holy Spirit, separate and apart from just the salvation experience, and there's a large branch of the Christian church that believes that. Uh, So the question became one as we studied on this, how do we know? Because there are some people who will come up to you and say, if you've not received the Holy Spirit in a way that's manifested itself in certain gifts of the Holy Spirit, then perhaps you're missing something. And I'd like to hear your comments on that, recognizing this is on the internet forever, <laughs> and you may want to be careful about what you say. Uh, but but uh, if you feel uh, uh, okay talking about that, I think that's a subject worthy of us hearing your thoughts on it. Well, I would emphatically reject that claim that uh, you have to speak in tongues to have the Holy Spirit. I think the the evidence of the the Holy Spirit in your life is first and foremost that we confess Christ. The Holy Spirit came to witness, testify to Christ, as John tells us. And those of us who have accepted that witness uh, and and embraced regeneration uh, confess Christ. We have faith in Christ, and we also have the fruit of the Spirit. So love, joy, peace, meekness, kindness, self-control. Uh, that, I think, is the telltale sign for sure, and transformation uh, in the image of Christ. I think those are the ways that we, we can be confident the Holy Spirit is in our life. And he witnesses to our spirit that we are sons of God. So if you have a confidence that you are a son of God, a child of God, uh, that is an evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life. But the idea there's one gift, I think, is very misguided. We all have some gift, but not any one gift is the sign. Paul says in Romans that uh, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. And so this means uh, the Spirit can't be viewed as a sort of a, a next level thing that will take some Christians to a higher level. Right. It's fundamental, basic level. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Christ. Absolutely. Now, I've learned a lot from a lot of Pentecostals and Charismatics, and what they're usually right about is it is possible to be experiencing more of the power and life and and fruit and even gifts of the Spirit than a lot of people settle for. In my mind, speaking as a non-Pentecostal, as a non-Charismatic, I think you're right about that, and I should take that as a a real um, goad to examine how my Christian life is. You're wrong about construing it as some kind of initial reception of the Spirit that waits for me to still go get after my conversion. Uh, yeah, well, so I think yeah, your question could be sort of read two ways. One is, how do we know we have the Spirit could be seen as a question about how do we know we're saved because the Spirit is involved in salvation. And so if we're saved, we have the Spirit. But obviously the, the real issue is, is that there are some, and since I already mentioned one of Pentecostals, you know, I guess it's my chance to sort of beat up on uh, some Pentecostals today, and so maybe those are the emails I'll be getting. But there are, there are some, um, some sort of small sections of Pentecostalism that insist on this, and I encountered the same thing when I was in high school and mm-hmm. um, had uh, people come to my door to insist that if I hadn't had the second blessing, um, then uh, I, I wasn't truly a Christian. And I knew uh, many people who were in these churches who um, uh, talked about uh, faking speaking in tongues in order to remain in good standing in the church. And so I've certainly had a fair amount of experience with it. The clearest you know, response to that is that Paul doesn't um, require us to speak in tongues in order to know that we're saved. And this is in 1 Corinthians. And so this is a, um, a fairly straightforward biblical question that could be answered easily. If, if I had thought this through when we had set up the panel, I would have invited a charismatic to be up here to uh, defend that perspective. I suspect we probably have some charismatics watching this either on the internet or 
are in the audience. And so, again, the, the lawyer in me says, I want to press back a little bit um, uh, and, and make sure that, that at least folks say, gee, why didn't anybody <laughs> ask them this? Um, the immediate passage that, that my friends who are charismatics would have said to you is, but doesn't Paul say in 1 Corinthians, I wish that everyone spoke in tongues. Uh, doesn't that kind of indicate that this is something that, that uh, uh, maybe uh, everyone should be pursuing? I don't know that I can speak for charismatics. I do have one colleague that says I'm a charismatic wannabe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I do uh, have one circle of charismatics that claim me on the mm -hmm. gift of prophecy, which I was a little mystified about, but I'm taking it. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in <laughs> by, their, by their rendering. Uh, but I, I would uh, just suggest that the question is, is this experience with the Spirit subsequent, uh, distinct from conversion, and is it subsequent? And I think on both issues, um, pressing as best we can with the language of the New Testament the answer would be no, um, that uh, you receive the Spirit, the same passage, uh, Romans 8, 9, and 10. If you can't have Christ unless you have the Spirit. I think Paul makes the logic work both ways. And so I think it's uh, uh, rather tight uh, in terms of the New Testament. Now, that being said, uh, I think it's fair to us, for us to understand in a time when we're talking about the neglect of the Holy Spirit that this may be the great century of the Holy Spirit, right? When church history is told, this will be the century of the Spirit. When Christianity has been cratering and dormant in the West, it's been exploding everywhere else. And uh, numbers uh, beyond our imagination, more people becoming Christian than we've ever imagined. Um, and in 1900, you wouldn't have counted uh, hardly anyone as a charismatic. Uh, it'd be a very thin piece of uh, a percent or so. And today, it would be, you'd be hard-pressed to count Christians worldwide as uh, less than one in four being charismatic. Maybe one in three would be very reasonable. And uh, so anyway, it is actually the great expansion of the church. The, no, we've never had a period in church history anywhere close to this where so many people have been becoming Christian and so on. And folks who stress the life of the Spirit are at the heart of that. And uh, it is... I, I think we'll have to call it the century of the spirit. Okay, so I'll, I'll give my two cent answer to this and, and I'll become a panel member for a moment. <laughs> okay. And please do not hesitate to tell me I disagree. Uh, I thrive in waters of disagreement. So it will not offend me in the least and I'll be glad to tell you why I'm right and you're wrong. Um, or I'll learn otherwise. So when I was confronting these issues in school, I, I, I was, boy, I wanted it. I didn't know what it was. I, didn't, I mean, if there's something there, give it to me. I'm all for it. Uh, don't let my ignorance, don't let my pride, don't let my embarrassment, don't let anything stand in the way. And I really started praying about these things. And at the same time, because of the way my brain works and the way I was trained in our church we grew up in I went to scripture and I went to John 14 15 and 16 which are the three chapters where Jesus speaks about multiple times the Holy Spirit's coming and it was my understanding that the Holy Spirit already had indwelt people prior to that, but on a selective basis. There would be certain people who would have the Spirit. But not all believers, in a sense. So believing in Christ, obviously, is not the issue yet. And so I read this, and I read a f couple of things that Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. I was writing them down. I mean, I, I'm a book guy. I'm writing them down in my book. He says to the apostles, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to teach you what you need to know and remind you the things you need to be reminded of, which is our basis for believing that apostolic scripture is authoritative from God. 
It's not something that they just were remind, you know, thinking of or remembering. It's what the Holy Spirit brought to their recollection. I got that. Then Jesus said that uh, he's going to send the Holy Spirit. He told them, you know him because he's with you. He was with them in the presence of Jesus. But he will be in you. And so I know that there's something different that's going to happen with the Holy Spirit, which we'll see in Pentecost. And then the third thing that Jesus says is when the Holy Spirit comes, and this is in John 15, I believe, he will bear witness to me. And then the last thing, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So I wrote those down. I thought, okay, now I'm going to read the rest of the New Testament. And I'm going to see if this is what the Holy Spirit does. Does the Holy Spirit bear witness to Jesus and convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment? And whether I was reading in Acts or whether I was reading in Romans or Corinthians or all the way through, even Revelation, that's what the Spirit seems to be doing. And I thought, well, this is interesting. I think I'll go backwards. So I started reading from John 14 backwards through the Bible. And even in the Old Testament, we find, in a sense, the Spirit not only convicting of sin, righteousness, and judgment, but also bearing witness to Jesus. And so I just decided at that point, I would tell all of my charismatic friends that the Holy Spirit, I know what the Holy Spirit does because Jesus told me. Hmm. I'm not going to put him in a box and tell him how to do his work. And then I would go to the First Corinthians passage and that fellow, which is translated, I wish, and I don't know how you treat that in your Bible translation, but that doesn't always mean wish. It can mean I'm willing. I'm willing for everybody to speak in tongues, but I'd rather say something people can understand. Comments? Well, just speaking for, uh, for a charismatic brother or in the place of a charismatic brother, I would say you might have left something out of that passage mm -hmm. that uh, when the Spirit comes, the Spirit will lead in the doing of even greater things than when I was with you. It seems to me that there is an anticipation of powerful acts in the Spirit. That's what they read in Acts and when they read in Acts and Acts 2 and 8 and 10, and they see this same pro proclamation of Jesus. They see this faith. They see the falling of the Spirit. They put those together in a chronological order. I don't agree with that, but I certainly understand how they would come to that, you know, pattern. In other words, wouldn't the same pattern follow today? I mean, that, that would be their argument. And, and I, that's a legitimate argument. Um, uh, my, my response to that would be uh, that is legitimately the Holy Spirit as long as it's bearing witness to Jesus or convicting of sin, righteousness, and judgment. If it's just show for show state, don't call that the Holy Spirit. There's a certain irony that we're here, though, asking why is the Holy Spirit no, so neglected? And when the people do manifest it, we, we look at them and say, oh, that's kind of... It's kind of untasteful. They should just be talking about Jesus. <laughs> do you, I mean, do you see the kind of quandary I think we're in? No, that's yeah. a great point. But they should be talking about Jesus. I, I say that as I grew up Pentecostal, and a saying in the Pentecostal church was, some people just get too fired up about the Spirit and talk about him all the time. But we, we know, my Pentecostal church would say, we know that if they really had the Holy Spirit, they'd be talking about Jesus all the time. So that's even, a, I mean, you know, Charismatics and Pentecostals are also critical thinkers who read the Bible, and they see some people going off the rails talking about the Holy Spirit, going, hey, you're, you're not getting this right. When you're really under the influence of the Spirit, you're going to be talking constantly about Jesus. I would second that. The Charismatic uh, friends that I, I would count as close and dear friends, trusted friends, uh, they're the last people I would think you'd ever uh, accuse of sensationalism or whatever are being distracted by the manifestations. Uh, they frankly are the most wonderful worshipers of Jesus that I know. Amen. Amen. Well said. Yeah, now, Randy, I mean, the, the passages that you brought up seem to me to be really good um, evidence against cessationism, some idea that the, um, the gifts of the Spirit will come to an end, they'll cease, they'll end of the, end of the apostolic period or something. 
but not really compelling evidence for a requirement that all exhibit right. various, you know, a certain <laughs> charismata or something like that, like speaking in tongues. Yeah, I, w I would just uh, second that you know, your observation. I, I could not, in good conscience, affirm some sort of cessationism. Mm -hmm. I think that reverses the one key verse that's in the conversation uh, to mean exactly the opposite of what it means. Hmm. In other words, uh, I was sort of bullied when I was a student in college. Well, you all believe that the Bible is perfect, don't you? So when that which is perfect has come, right? <laughs> And uh, I was a little suspicious back then, but <laughs> learned a little bit more. That, uh, but, but anyway, I, I just found it ironically that, that, that I'd be threatened with this idea that maybe you're not really a true believer in the Bible, when honestly that just seems to be a really flippant kind of subversive uh, uh, application of that text, which seems to indicate that these kind of gifts will be around. So I'm not there at the, at the cessationist, but at the same time, I, I would um, also concede, I, I do not think that the New Testament scripts certain gifts for everyone. I think that is short-sighted. I just do not see that uh, to be the case. Okay, so compare and contrast the gifts of the Spirit that seem to be miraculous versus the gifts of the Spirit in Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Versus you will do greater things than I. Speaking in tongues, raising lucky from the dead, Eutychus, Greek for lucky. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? Y'all know that, right? Mm -hmm. Eutychus, who's up in the window when Paul's preaching, and Paul goes on so long, he falls and he kills himself. Eutychus, his name means lucky. So old Lucky was in the window and fell and died, but Paul was right there and revived him. Just some of the humor of the Bible. But, uh, uh, you know, Paul's apron, um, uh, you know, the, talk to us. So, so what... what Randy was saying, for those of you who may not be tuned in to the nuances of this debate, cessationism is the idea that, that those gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased. And the scripture that's typically used by cessationists to argue that is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that great love chapter, isn't it 13? Mm -hmm. Where it says, when the perfect comes, the teleos comes, that the imperfect will pass away. And cessationists argue that the scripture is the perfect. So mirac miraculous displays of the Holy Spirit were necessary to authenticate the ministry of people before the Bible was there to authenticate. But the Bible, a product of the Holy Spirit, has now taken the place of those miracles and we no longer need them. They died out with the apostolic age, or at least the generation after the apostles, uh, with that background. So mm -hmm. add the background. I've added that for a few folks that may want to hear that background. <laughs> so then the question becomes, guys, talk to us about uh, why we, is there any distinction at all between the gifts of the Spirit that are these miraculous gifts versus the gifts of the Spirit that are just seem to be common everyday gifts for every Christian. I'm going to say a couple of vague things about the uh, spectacular gifts, um, but first I'm going to buy myself the right to be vague. <laughs> um, the reason I'm vague is not because I'm afraid of making a commitment, because I'm tr trying to try the best I can to do biblical theology that's appropriate to the evidence presented. It would be easier to be dogmatic on one side or the other and to say, Christian, you have the Holy Spirit if and only if you are baptized at a subsequent event with the accompanying evidence of speaking in tongues for the first time. Put that in a doctrinal statement from one of the old line, you know, assemblies kind of churches and say, that's what it is. It's absolutely clear. If you don't speak in tongues the first time you pray through and get the Holy Spirit, then you are not baptized in the Spirit. That would be clear. I just think it vastly exceeds the evidence and there's no warrant for that affirmation. The other side would be the one that you mentioned, would be um, miraculous gifts, spectacular gifts, simply are not going to happen since the closing of the canon 
when I suppose the Apostle John put the last period at the end of the last, did he put a period at the end of a Greek sentence? Wrote the last letter uh, at the end of the Revelation on Patmos. Boom, that was it. The Holy Spirit closed up shop on miraculous gifts and said, well, now there's a Bible. Um, that would also be a much easier answer. Um, I, I mean, a, a mean way to say this is wrong answers are usually easier. Right? <laughs> so what it leaves you is responsible theology about these spectacular gifts in the middle is going to sound sort of, I don't know, wishy-washy, as if it's not bold enough to go for one of these absolute answers. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, yeah, I don't know. Well, I, I, I would distinguish. I mean, the, the, the Galatians passage actually talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. And it's clear that that is intended for all persons because it contrasts that with the fruit of the flesh. The works of the flesh. Works of the flesh, right. And so uh, Paul also makes very clear when he talks about the gifts of the Spirit using the analogy of the body. Not everything is the eye, not everything is the ear, not everything is you know, the hand or whatever. And do all prophesy, do all speak in tongues, the implied answer being clearly no. So I think it's clear just from that comparative standpoint, the fruit in Galatians is intended to be mature and to grow in all Christians, all of the fruit. All of us have some, one or more gifts, but it clearly teaches or implies we don't have, no person has every gift and no one gift is expected of all persons. So you can't imagine Paul saying, you know, uh, does everyone love? Well, no, not everyone (laughs) loves. Is everyone kind? Not everyone is kind. Is everyone patient? Not everyone is patient. But he, he says that about the gifts. Excellent. Excellent. Well said. And maybe Ephesians as well, where you're the command to be filled with the Spirit. But when you look at those participles that follow, that sort of flesh that out in the next verses, um, it's not fireworks that you get. It's, uh, you know, a, a generosity uh, or th- gratitude, rather, and, uh, and thankfulness. And uh, then your relationships are recast with this attitude uh, we draw from Christ to humble ourselves uh, to, uh, before him and to one another. And, and so um, every, re- every relationship then is re- recast. And so what the spirit looks like uh, when it get, I think, grasp a person is not necessarily only these phenomenal gifts. I think those gifts would be diverse. The spirit would distribute them as... Um, he wills, and um, as it's, it's, uh, it's said, and so I, I just uh, have come from a tradition that was too easy to dismiss these things, and uh, I've I've sought to uh, through through some journey with some friends and so on. I, I've just learned that there's something there that is profound and wise, and not, and, and I, I certainly don't ever give the impression that I would dismiss it. Philip, you've got anything to say? You, you, I've, I've looked to, to them, and I don't mean to cut you out of this. No, Walls took everything I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> then we're going to start with you on this one. Uh, and, and before I, I get too far, I'm going to tell you guys, I'm going to ask you a really bizarro, who cares kind of question. Um, so you can start thinking about it in the back of your brain before I uh, this, this is coming, okay? It's just not one that's fair to spring on you without you having a moment to think about it. So I'll come back to this in a minute, but the question's going to be, do biblical writers in the New Testament deal with the idea of the Holy Spirit differently? Do we see something different from Paul than we might see, for example, in the Gospel of Matthew or than we might see in the Petrine epistles or something like that? And a related question, which you could also answer instead, is do you find that if we just had the Gospels, would you still have your theology of the Holy Spirit? Or if we just had Paul's writings, would we still have your theology of the Holy Spirit. So I'll be mulling that over so that when I get to it, you don't say, oh man, why'd you ask me that first? I didn't have a clue that was coming. And before we get to that question, I'll start with you, Philip. And we've walked around this, but I want to be more direct. What are the modern day threats and heresies that you see um, in terms of the Holy Spirit? Hmm. Well, 
Um, of course, I've you know talked about oneness Pentecostalism um, or this sort of new modalism, and so I think that's pretty frequent. We've talked about neglect of the spirit, and so there are, there are a lot of ways to fall off the horse, right? I mean, you can make all sorts of mistakes. I think one thing that I hear a lot that seems really relevant to me is um, there's a, a <clears throat> tendency today for people to talk about being spiritual but not religious, right? So the kind of the most frequent heresy of the spirit you might hear mm, that's good. from contemporary people who want to kind of have, as it were, um, some claim on the spirit, but without, without it being attached to any particular spirit. And, and so the, the language of spirituality in the New Testament is mostly Pauline. It's referring to the Holy Spirit. To be spiritual is to be of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we, we kind of, I mean, as, as we do as consumers, we want to kind of um, get to have the the goods, but without having, without paying as little as possible. And so I think um, it's very common now for, you know, for folks to want to talk about spirituality. Very often they're talking about, you know, maybe just a certain openness or to wonder or, you know, willingness to kind of, you know, think about higher values or, or something like that. But ultimately, um, you know, all spiritual claims have to be grounded in some very specific religious doctrines. We have to, you know, root these things somewhere, and, and so, um, so I think our kind of, our modern heresy, as it were, is a certain kind of consumerism about the spirit. We want to get all the benefits of the spirit, all the, um, uh, all the good things, but without having to actually commit to a spirit that can truly guide us and challenge us and convict us, as you've so frequently mentioned. Great. Randy, you got any ideas beyond what you've said on current you know, what you see as a modern-day threat or, or concern or heresy? Well, I think these are well-spoken well, well, well uh, here by Philip. Uh, and um, I, I went to a partial laundry list before. Um, on, the, on the spirituality, um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Blackwell, uh, contrasts religion and spirituality as it's done before, and he has a spiel or two on, on that. But... I just think there's a, a great, it, it's almost like a, a badge, there's a great prize to consider yourself spiritual, like you're in tune or tuned in, you know, right? Uh, but um, I, I just feel like that's hollow uh, if it's not sort of, uh, especially as Christians, incarnated into a concrete uh, reality with people, I think. Uh, for all of our talk about uh, reconciliation and so on, the real work of reconciliation on the sanctification side is a good Protestant, I would say, but is done in a church where you live with people and you learn, and they have to live with you. <laughs> <coughs> you have to become aware that it's hard to live with you, right? And then, I mean, but it's, it's in that uh, experience of of kind of real life in in the church, that the spirit really does its work. That's that's how the spirit, I think, molds us. Yeah, and it's notable when the spirit shows up in Acts, right? The first thing the spirit does basically is make a church, right? And so if you, if you, you know, the spirit leads yeah. us into fellowship and into church itself. Yeah, so the idea of a non-communal option for the spirit, I think is on very, very thin ice. Come on, <laughs> Well, um, in addition to that, I think, I think people try to get away with stuff with the Holy Spirit. What I mean is, people sometimes get the sense that, okay, we know who Jesus is. He's really clear about that. Lots of, a high percentage of the New Testament is specifically about him concretely. And if you make up stuff about Jesus, people catch you pretty quickly, right? Um, but you can just say stuff about the Holy Spirit. I, I feel like, you know, you'll, you'll read books and say, religious pluralism, where you say, well, if you're reconciled to God through Jesus, of course, you're a Christian, and that's very exclusive. It's only, you know, the only way to God through Jesus is to be a Christian. But the Spirit, I mean, who knows what he's up to? You know, he could be out there in the world doing all kinds of non-Jesus-y things that are groovy and unspecified. Like, who even knows? And what you want to say is, actually, the New Testament knows that, you know, you could work on your pneumatology here, your doctrine of the Holy Spirit. He's, 
He's actually a very specific somebody, and um, to me it's good news, but to you it might be bad news that um, he's going to take you to Jesus. Right? So, yeah, when, when Jesus said there's no way to the Father except through me, he didn't mean, oh, or the Spirit, I forgot. Right? Yeah. And so I just think people let themselves get away with a kind of a vagueness, which if you reduce it down to basic claims, is silly. Um, so, so I had a, a, a friend of mine who's a, a judge up in Dallas, great, great fella, marvelous, godly man. And we were talking about this one time, and he says, yeah, he says, I get a little frustrated when people say the Holy Spirit told me to do this or do that. <clears throat> he said, one time I just said to him, I said, uh, how do you know it was the Holy Spirit? And he said, well, I, I, I felt it right here. And Judge said, generally, that's your lunch. He <laughs> <laughs> said, I just think you had something bad for lunch. But people will always uh, have an ability. It's hard to measure and to test that unless you're doing it by, does it point to Jesus? Those types of things. Okay, uh, uh, you, you, you've got to help us out on this, Jerry. What is uh, threats, uh, heresies? What are the concerns you see? Well, I, I'm just going to kind of build on what he said, actually. A phrase you often hear, it's actually a word of condemnation. People often speak and say, you're not showing the spirit of Christ. And what that means is you're not being nice, postmodern, 21st century style. So the spirit of Christ just means whatever is nice by contemporary cultural standards. And it's about splitting the, the, the word and the spirit. And, and um, as one who, you know, attends a church that is part of a liberal denomination, although my particular church is not, you often hear invoked in these church circles, you know, defenses, let's say, of, of homosexuality, homosexual behavior. The Holy Spirit is leading us in this direction. And again, the Holy Spirit is always doing the nice thing. So that's, I think, one very present danger. Yeah, you don't often hear, I don't know, maybe you do in the right circles. You hear the Holy Spirit's leading me to, I, and I'll take a step back. I can remember, so, so when, when I was in school, I went, to a, um, I went to two churches when I was studying uh, uh, these things, uh, study into, for the ministry. And one of them was a very non-charismatic traditional church. And one of them was a charismatic church. And I would go to, go to both. I hit them both. And it was interesting. So when my compatriots were learning to be charismatic, and that's maybe a horrible way for me to say it, but that's what I believed seemed to be going on when they were learning to be charismatic they went through the stage where they were deciding that God was giving them a spirit of judgment and um, and a discernment that's the other side yeah and they would they would do the other side they would come up and say you know the spirit's telling me to tell you that you're not dressing appropriately and uh, or that you've got some secret sin in your life and you know at first you sit there and you say well gee, do I? You know, you start trying to think through it because you want to be sensitive. And then you start thinking, man, I don't know. I can't figure that one out, you know, and you go back and forth. So it, it seems we can go all around the map on those things. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a little bit of time. We've got 13 minutes. So here's, uh, yes, I am, a, I am a time Nazi. I mean, it's like, Bam. Um, and I've got several things that I wanted to talk to you about. So this is going to be the lightning round. What does Paul mean when he says, don't quench the spirit? Jerry, we'll start with you. We'll work down here to you, Philip. Don't quench the spirit. Uh, don't resist his leading, guiding, directing. Okay. Anybody to add to it before the next lightning round? No. It's a good answer. Good answer. Okay. <laughs> Don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Unforgivable sin. Go. Well, uh, the, this has been interpreted a lot of different ways, but the, um, one of the most fundamental things to understand in order to understand this passage is that in that particular context, the Pharisees are ascribing the work of Jesus to the work of demons. Um, and so blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is looking at the action and power of God and seeing it the exact opposite of the way it is and doing so obstinately. Uh, despite the fact that you should know better.
Okay, does anybody want to take issue with whether or not that's an unforgivable sin? Or I do not think it Obst- is Being obstinate is the thing that is unforgivable. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, the, the unrepented sin is the unforgivable sin, and that is resisting the Holy Spirit when he convicts you. Okay. If, so, if you share the resolve that Jesus does not represent uh, the Father and work in the power of the Spirit... And that is your conviction. And I, I don't think there is any remedy for that person. Which was the conviction of Paul at the stoning of Stephen. And when he got the letters to go to Damascus. And yet he found forgiveness. So, so help I, us with I, that. I, wouldn't, I, I think we are misled when we get in this image. Did I say it wrongly once? Or, did I, or have I made a declaration on the internet and now it can't be forgiven? Uh, again, I think the failure there is if you attribute to Jesus uh, not being a, a connected with the Father or empowered by the Spirit, if he's not really the agent of God, doing the work of God, then I think that is a crucial failure. I, I, but I don't think it's a magic sort of thing that you render once or twice or whatever and mm-hmm. then lose. The main thing I noticed there is that the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is getting something wrong about Jesus. Right? It's, it's not as if, well, I got my doctrine of God the Father, right, and then I believe and confess the right things about Jesus, but then when I got to the Holy Spirit part of the test, I blasphemed him. Right. No, it was, it's, it's referring back to the work of Jesus as representing the Father. Yeah. So there, there was that terrible movement, it might still be going on, of young people making YouTube videos of them saying terrible things about the Holy Spirit and saying, look, there I did it, it's time stamped, I blasphemed the Holy Spirit, now I'm, I don't have to play this Christian game or whatever, I'm beyond hope, beyond redemption. Ha, I did it. Now, there's a lot going on there with them spiritually, but I don't think they just logged some kind of entry in the unre- unerasable mm-hmm. book of heaven that they, they actually ought to the very next day right. tell God they're sorry about that and repent. And I think the New Testament is plain that uh, when they come to another faith perspective on Jesus, there is a, a redemption possible. Yeah, and in those, in those videos, very often, they just would deny the existence of the Holy Spirit, thinking this is that mm-hmm. blasphemy. But again, it's um, the work of Jesus is being attributed to the work of the devil in, right. the, in that, that particular context. And, and, and so it's, it's more than just denying the existence of the Holy Spirit. It's looking at the, um, the work of God and seeing it as the work of the devil. Okay, Capes, you've got to come up here for just a minute. And we're out of time soon, so you've got to hustle. Run, run, run. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Woo! That was fast. Y'all missed it. He hurtled three pews. He went charismatic on us. He jumped a pew. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, the Matthew passage, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. The verb tense of will not be forgiven, it's future. Uh, I didn't make you do that. Yeah, it's a future passage. Future passive. Yeah. Okay. So um, we've got the future passive. Uh, uh, it, it reads, Afethesetai, um, that blasphemy uk afethesetai will not be forgiven. Can we use the verb tense to say that, that what these men are saying theologically, can we say it scripturally? In other words, at the time, at the end of days, at the... the, the Final judgment, the person who at that point in time is still slandering, who is anti, uh, who is a blasphemer, who refuses Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, can we rely on that verb tense to allow us to say theologically, you know, you might put something now, you might be, see it that way now, but tomorrow you may... Heed the Holy Spirit and, and, and turn to Jesus, and everyone can turn regardless. Yeah, I, think, I think Jerry, I'm not sure this is working, but take mine. Um, Jerry mentioned this obstinacy, this per- persistence. You know, we, we, we say that saints will persist. You know, they're going to persevere. I think the same thing is true of those who aren't saints. They will persevere as well till the end. And so they will continually deny, continually say... Uh, uh, and continue to live in such a way as we've described that the Spirit is working, and yet, yet, and yet, I will not confess Jesus, uh, regardless. And I think that is the persistence of, of unfaith, and that is what happens at the final judgment. That becomes um, 
God's judgment is passed that will not be forgiven in the future judgment. But it's that persistence that goes on. And that's a fair thing to get from that passage. I think it's fair, yeah. yeah. In other words, I don't want to do it just because it's the spiritual thing to do, and it sounds really nice and good to say that about God. I'd like to know textually, is that fair to the passage? Fair to say, yeah. Fair to say. Okay, so here we are. We've got about five minutes left. I, I, I know that my question was not necessarily a fair one. Thank you, David, by the way. I'm um, but I'll give it to you in three different ways you can answer it. Either tell me where your favorite, uh, gee, this seems right, this is my go-to place for understanding the Holy Spirit is in Scripture, or tell me if you think that there are some book. you know, read the Gospel of Mark, I'm just not sure I'd have my theology if that's all I had. Uh, without the Gospel of John, I'm not sure I'd have it. Or tell me if you see maybe some differences in how the Gospel writers treat the Holy Spirit. That gives you a panoply of options to get your final word in about the Holy Spirit and why. Philip, we'll start with you. We'll work our way down to Jerry. Uh, yeah, well, your question was, you know, it would, be, would our theology of the Spirit be different if we just isolated out different chunks of the New Testament? I think obviously the answer would be yes, um, which is that we, the whole of Scripture is needed to fully kind of understand God's self-revelation. But... Um, you know, when you read um, passages that often are not, you know, primarily used in talking about the Spirit, you're often surprised at seeing how the Spirit is present. So, you know, Luke 1 and 2, those are kind of the Christmas passages. We like to read those in church around Christmas time. And, uh, and if, you know, but, and so we think of them as Jesus passages, but they're also Spirit passages. It's by the Spirit that the uh, Son becomes incarnate. It's by the Spirit um, that's on Simeon that he then kind of praises God and, and prophesies about who this baby would be. And so um, the Spirit is kind of all over the place in, in uh, passages that we often don't go to as our sort of ideal passages. But I think you asked what my favorite go-to passage was, and um, I love theology and the arts, and so I actually... It would be totally wrong for me to say that a, a poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins is my favorite scripture passage, but it is, it is something that I think helps me understand some scriptural imagery, which is a lot of scriptural language about the Spirit is sometimes impersonal, as, as Fred mentioned earlier, which is we have wind, we have fire, and, and then when there is a kind of an animate thing, it's, this, it's a bird, right? So it's like hard to think of a bird as a, a person. We see the, the dove descend. But um, I love the way that Gerard Manley Hopkins describes the role of the Holy Ghost in the world in his poem, God's Grandeur, and he concludes this way, and this will be the last thing I say. He says, um, there lives a dearest freshness deep down things, and though the last lights off the black west went, O oh morning at the bright brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods, broods like a chicken on its eggs, with warm breast and ah, bright wings. And this actually brings home to us something that the Nicene Creed says about the Spirit, which is the giver of life. And so in this image, that bird imagery is applied to the whole world. The Spirit is like a, a mother bird sitting on the world, keeping it alive. It's the life of the world. And, and so I think this helps me to see um, that, that bird imagery that we have in the, the baptism of Jesus in, in sort of a new light. Wonderful. Right. To the question of uh, do the New Testament writers uh, differ, I, w I would say the um, answer there would be yes. Uh, we would expect this to happen. It happens uh, with different vocabulary, different imagery, and so on. Uh, but uh, a, a good doctrine of Scripture would not suggest there's a uniformity. There's not only one thing said. Uh, but that uh, all of these particular things uh, are profoundly true and that they can, uh, a conservative uh, person would want to say in their scripture, uh, or their doctrine of scripture, that those things can be um, brought together to make a, a unified kind of cohesive sort of declaration. So I, I would say that you would be impoverished if you didn't have Paul. I think if you have Paul, you could go find in the synoptics things that are maybe surprising that you didn't, no, that would be there. Uh, for example, you know, Jesus seems to be sort of taking orders from the Spirit, right? It's the Spirit that leads him. The Spirit, all right, that empowers him and guides him. Uh, when 
um, the tables are turned. Uh, it seems now the Spirit's right doing the bidding of the risen Jesus. Um, but I, I, I don't know that you would see that. Uh, but once you have these Trinitarian images, you begin to see them again and again. So in the passage you suggested, that might be my favorite passage, the 14, 15, 16 of John. Um, I, would, uh, I would argue that it's not just the Spirit's coming in those passages. Uh, but those passages, 8, 14 and 16, which are basically duplicates, they each are Trinitarian. Uh, if you, I think if you read them in their particulars, you can go to, to um, oh, uh, Raymond Brown would uh, highlight this for you uh, as a commentator. But the Son's coming, the Spirit's coming, and the Father's coming. It's Trinitarian. Fred? <laughs> Um, yeah, I do think that the authors of the New Testament speak differently and, and teach uh, in a different way. They don't teach different material, and they certainly don't disagree with each other. But yeah, it's crucial that they um, bring out different things. We talked about uh, how the Spirit is, uh, indwells New Covenant believers in a unique way, though the Spirit was never absent from believers at any point in salvation history. There is something new that happens on the basis of the finished work of Christ. That means that Paul has a certain interpretive priority because he's talking about that in that context and teaching about it. The Gospels, it's, a, it's an interesting genre. What is the Gospel? It's a, it's a story written after the resurrection about what Jesus was like before the resurrection when the people didn't quite understand what was going on, but they do now that they're writing it. Right? So it's, it's, a, it's a complicated genre, and that's what all four Gospels are. So in the nature of, of that genre, you're going to be having the things you're allowed to narrate, the things you will narrate there, aren't going to be teaching about the New Testament ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you have a long passage where you're teaching instead of narrating events, then you can get teaching about the Spirit, John 14, 15, 16, and a couple of those large blocks of Jesus' teaching in Matthew. But in the actual narrative, you don't. And can I just say to get the whole Bible in there, I left out what my Old Testament scholar friend Joe calls most of the Bible, that is the <laughs> Old Testament. Um, there you've got something where moving backward from the clarity we get in Paul, you can really grasp what's going on in the, in the Gospels. Then you go back to the large territory of the Old Testament where the person we're talking about, the Holy Spirit, is never referred to as the Holy Spirit. That, that, that adjective in front of that noun is in fact a New Testament phenomenon there are two exceptions in the Old Testament, but they don't seem to be picking out the third person of the Trinity, like take not your Holy Spirit from me. Um, so, so even the name and, and much of the concreteness of who we're talking about, when you get back into the Old Testament, think, I'm glad I'm reading backwards at this point because moving mm -hmm. forward, Spirit of God and glory of God and shiny cloud of God um, are not quite enough material for a pneumatology. Yeah. Good. Jerry? Hate to be repetitive, but it's John. Uh, again, uh, John is the most exalted Christological book. Not surprising, it's the most uh, explicit uh, Trinitarian book, uh, Holy Spirit book. All this talk about how you respond to Jesus means how, you, the, how you're responding to the Father and vice versa. And there's this remarkable series of texts, you know, where Jesus says, before the foundation of the world, you know, the Father loved me. Then he says, and now I have loved you as the Father loved me. And then he has the gall to say, now I want you to love each other the way I've loved you. Which has extraordinary Trinitarian implications that we are, so to speak, to recreate Trinitarian love by the power of the Holy Spirit responding to the Father and the Son. Okay, I'll throw mine out there briefly. I think mine is probably found in uh, Acts 1 and Acts 2. In this sense... And I'm going to key off of what, what Fred said. And when you read the Gospels themselves, it's readily apparent that before uh, the resurrection of Jesus, certainly, but even immediately afterwards, those Gospel writers really don't have a clue what's going on. I mean, they don't in John 14, 15, 16. You know, Thomas is, is just absolutely clueless. They don't seem to afterwards. Jesus on the road to Emmaus is having to explain everything. But they had been assured that there will come a day where Jesus will send a helper who will be in them, even though he's currently with them. And that when that helper comes, he will teach them and he will remind them. And there'll be a facility to do that. And they're really clueless. 
until Pentecost. And then with Pentecost, all of a sudden you've got Peter standing up and preaching a high Christology of, of justification by faith in the finished work of Jesus and, and what it means. And he's convicting those who are there of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's doing the very things that Jesus had said the Holy Spirit would do. And I really like that hand in glove. So we are really done with the panel, but before I excuse you, we will have a word of prayer. And before the word of prayer, I'm going to ask Fred to give us a 30-second preview of tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow night I'm speaking on the uh, Trinity in the Bible, and so I'm going to try to sketch out first in a very broad way the uh, biblical theology of the revelation of the triune God as Father, Son, and Spirit. Spend some time relating the Old Testament message to the New Testament message. Um, and after working through that, I'll go through, I think, five key passages in the New Testament and kind of unpack what came to be traditional Trinitarian doctrine from the New Testament source. We will have Q&A tomorrow with him after his lecture. Sunday morning, he will be interviewed by me uh, at uh, two different uh, campuses of the class that I teach. So there's lots more to come. Would you join me in a word of prayer, and then we'll thank them with some applause. Father, we're first thankful to you uh, for the way that you have continued to work diligently within your body to, to teach us and to, to uh, educate us about who you are in ways where we can grow. We thank you for you, your, your, your presence in our lives. We thank you for the, the indwelling spirit, and we pray that we will uh, seek to know you as fully as we can so that we can better glorify you and better uh, bring your, your work to this world to see and understand and to come under the work and of Jesus, and the grace that you've given us on the cross. This is our prayer. Uh, in your name, amen. Join me in thanking these folks, please.